I always have to look, right? Um, to see when I'm teaching during the day, when I'm teaching online, I, I'm, it's so confusing. So I don't blame you. All right, let's begin with our first presentation. We've got Adrian and Koa presenting on the Bolshevik Revolution. I am ready to be dazzled and amazed. Oh, miss, you see it? Yeah, we can see it. <coughs> okay, so today we're talking about the Bolshevik Revolution. What is the Bolshevik Revolution? The Russian Revolution of 1917 was one of the most explosive political events of the 20th century. The violent revolution marked the end of the Romanov dynasty and the centuries of Russian imperial rule. During the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik led by leftist revolutionary Vladimir Lenin seized power and destroyed the Judaism Tsarist rule. <coughs> Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, also called Vladimir Leech Lenin, he was born on April 22nd, 1870, Simbers, Russia, and died January 21st, 1924, in Gorky. He was the founder of the Russian Communist Party, Bolsheviks, inspirer and leader of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, and the architect, builder, and the first head of the Soviet state until 1924. He was the founder of the organization known as Kami Intern, or Communist International and the post thomas source of Leninism, the doctrine codified and conjoined with Karl Marx's works by Lenin's successors to form Marxism and Leninism, which became the communist worldview. Joseph Stalin. Joseph Stalin, real name Georgian Osip Dihadjvili, was born on December 18, 1878, Gor Gori, Georgia, in the Russian Empire, and died March 5, 1953, Moscow, Russia. He was the Secretary General of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union from 1922 to 1953, and the Premier of the Soviet State from 1941 to 1953. He, was, he dictatorially ruled the Soviet Union for a quarter of a century and transformed it into a major world power. Leon Trotsky. Left Davidovich Bronstein, better known as Leon Trotsky, was born November 7th, 1879 and died <laughs> August 21st, 1940. Leon Trotsky was a Russian revolutionary pol political theorist and politician. Ideologically a uh, communist, he developed a variant of Marxism known as Trotskyism. Trotsky joined the Bolshevik party a few weeks before the October Revolution and became one of the few leaders of the party. Once, once in government, Trotsky initially held the post of the Commissar of Foreign Affairs and he was involved with the brest lodovic negotiations with Germany as Russia pulled out of World War I. Trotsky was more prominent from March 8, 1918 to January 1925 as the leader of the Red Army in the post of the Commissaire of Military and Naval Affairs. Trotsky was a vital leading figure in the Red Victory of the Russian Civil War. He was one of the seven members of the, of the first Politburo. After the rise of Joseph Stalin, Trotsky was removed from his positions and eventually expelled from the Soviet Union in February 1929. He spent the rest of his life in exile and was assassinated in Mexico City by a Soviet NKVD agent. The Kontinka Tragedy. On May 30th, 1896, a stampede in Moscow occurs during festivities following Nicholas II's coronation. As crowds worried that the supplies of free souvenirs would run out, people <coughs> rushed to the stalls to get them. This resulted in the death of over 1,300 people. That's an old fire revolution at Bloody Sunday. 
On January 22, 1905, Donald started Sunday, troops and police opened fire on a peaceful demonstration outside the Winter Palace and elsewhere in St. Petersburg, killing and injuring around 1,000 people, the liberal press blames Nicholas II. On October 30, 1905, Tsar Nicholas II issues the October Manifesto, promising civil liberties such as freedom of speech and an elected parliament. As a result, Restrictions are implemented on the absolute power of a Russian monarch, and the de facto constitution, the fundamental laws of 1906, is issued. February Revolution A series of public protests begin in Portugal, which lasts for eight days and eventually result in the in abolition of the monarchy in Russia. The total number of killed and injured in clashes with the police and government troops in Portugal is estimated around 1. 1,300 people. March 8, 1917. On International Women's Day, demonstrators and striking workers made a prompt agreement to take to the streets and protest food shortage and the world. Two days later, the skies spread across Portugal. On March 15, 1917, Tsar Nicholas II abdicated and removed his son from the succession. The following day, Nicholas' brother, Mikhail, announces his refusal to accept the term. A provisional government is formed to replace the Soviet government, with Prince the Wolf becoming the leader. June Offensive and July Day On, on July 1st, Russian Minister of War Alexander Kerensky launches an offensive against Russia and Hungary in- We can't hear you, Koa. You can hear me? Miss, do you hear me? Miss? Oh, well, we can't hear you. Uh, miss, do you hear yeah. me? Okay. Uh, I do now. You're going to start over again. We didn't hear you. All right, Miss. June offensive and July days. On July 1st, 1917, Russian Minister of War Alexander Kerensky launches an offensive against Russia and Hungary forces in Galicia. Although the Russian effort is initially successful, the Soviets soon refused to leave the trenches and fight due to the law moral caused by the revolution. Soldiers committees debate orders and encourage soldiers to disobey officers. Many soldiers return home to take part in redistribution of land. The offensive collapsed four days later and Russian troops must respond to the Austrians and Germans counter offensive. July 16 and 20, the July days, a series of spontaneous armed anti-government demonstrations of industrial workers and soldiers begin in Portugal. The Wolf resides as a leader of provisional government, with Alexander Kerensky taking over recursing and demonstrations. In the same month, the death penalty is reintroduced, and government are granted the right to vote and, and hold office. Uh, Kerensky issues the arrest of Lenin, who goes into hiding. The printing office of the Bolshevik newspaper, Pravda, the headquarters of the Bolshevik Central Committee, are raided with many Bolshevik leaders arrested. The apartheid rising resulted in Soviet losing the control over provisional governments, signifying the end of a dual power situation. This is seen by many as the point of no return for the peaceful development of the revolution. The Cornell Law of Affair on September 9, 1917, a failed coup by General Kornilov, commander of the Russian army, takes place when he orders troops towards Petrograd to counter the threat of the Bolsheviks. Prime Minister Kerensky presents Kornilov's actions as an attempted right-wing coup. While the affair is short-lived, it secures power for the Bolsheviks among Petrograd's working classes, workers, and soldiers, and crushes the credibility of a coalition provisional government between socialists and liberals due to cadets and even currently himself being implicated in the affair. October Revolution and the Press Litovsky Treaty October Revolution and the Press Litovsky Treaty The Bolshevik seized control of Portugal on November 7, 1917. The Bolshevik took control of the Winter Palace, the last remaining holdout of the provisional government on November 8. 1917, the decrees on land, proclaiming abolition of private property and the redistribution of 
of land among the Pinochet and East, proposing an immediate withdrawal of Russia from the First World War, and is used by the new Bolshevik government. Subsequent workers decreased allied measures for an eight hour working day, minimum wage, and the running of factories. The, the death penalty is applied once again on November 8th. Call your microphone keeps cutting out. March. Sorry? Your microphone keeps cutting out. Oh. Uh, where is it? Is sued by the new Bolshevik government. Subsequent workers decreased allied measures for an eight hour working day. Minimum wage and the running of factories. The death penalty is abolished once again on November 8, 1917. On March 3, 1918, Russia ends its participation on the Fourth World War. Post with Russia loses one third of all empire population. One third of its railway network have its industry. Through water of its supplies of iron ore, nine tenths of its coal resources, and much of its food supply. And it is our multimedia piece. We're gonna make it bigger for you to see it. Wait a sec. In 1894, Nicholas II became ruler of a Russian empire that stretched from the Baltic to the Pacific. Inhabited by 126 million people from 194 ethnic groups. It was a country in which workers and peasants lived in poverty and hardship, while Russia's elite, its imperial family and aristocracy, lived lives of gilded luxury. There was a long history of struggle in Russia against the injustices of the system. And in 1905, a revolution forced the Tsar to allow the creation of a state Duma or National Assembly. But its power was limited and the compromise pleased neither the Tsar nor the reformers. In 1914, this divided empire was plunged into fresh crisis by World War. World War I was a disaster for Tsarist Russia. At the front, the country suffered a series of devastating defeats, while at home, there were food shortages and economic chaos. The Tsar was held responsible for the crisis. After all, he was now the army's commander-in-chief, and he was standing in the way of government reform. His German-born wife, Empress Alexandra, was even thought to be supporting Germany while the entire family was said to have fallen under the spell of a Siberian mystic and faith healer, Grigory Rasputin. In December 1916, Rasputin was murdered by Russian aristocrats, possibly with the help of British secret agents. Both groups determined to end his influence over the Tsar. But in the eyes of many, the damage had already been done. On the 23rd of February 1917, thousands of women took to the streets of the Russian capital, Petrograd, to mark International Women's Day and protest over bread shortages. The next day, they were joined on the streets by workers and students carrying placards that read, Down with the Tsar. 
troops, ordered to put down the disorder, mutinied and joined the protesters instead. Tsarist officials were arrested. Prisons and police stations were attacked. Emblems of Tsarist rule smashed and burned. The government had lost control of the capital. The Tsar was told by his ministers that order could only be restored and Russia saved from military defeat if he gave up power. So on the 2nd of March, Nicholas agreed to abdicate. In just 10 days, 300 years of Romanov rule had come to an end. The February Revolution had been remarkably swift and bloodless, and hopes were now high for the creation of a more democratic, more just Russian state. Members of the State Duma, the National Assembly, had formed a provisional government, which was to hold power until a constituent assembly was elected, to give Russia a new constitution. But in reality, the provisional government shared power with the Petrograd Soviet, a council elected by workers and soldiers that controlled the capital's troops, transport and communications. The Petrograd Soviet, dominated by the Socialist Revolutionary Party and the Marxist Menshevik Party, was much more radical than the provisional government. Yet it supported the government's decision to continue the war and honour the commitments that Russia had made to the Allies. It was a fateful decision that ultimately played into the hands of one of the smaller parties, the Bolsheviks. Their leader, Vladimir Lenin, recently returned from 16 years in exile bitterly opposed the imperialist war. He also demanded the immediate redistribution of land, from rich landowners to peasants, and the transfer of power from the bourgeois provisional government to the People's Soviets or councils that were springing up across Russia. The Bolshevik program was summed up in a simple slogan, bread, peace and land. And as Russia's economic and military crisis deepened, its appeal to the masses grew and grew. In June, a new Russian military offensive ended in disaster, with 400,000 Russian casualties, massive desertions, and the collapse of army morale and discipline. In July, soldiers and sailors in Petrograd mutinied. They were joined in the streets by workers with Bolshevik support. But troops loyal to the provisional government opened fire on the protesters and dispersed the crowds. A police crackdown followed, leading to the arrest of several Bolshevik leaders, including Leon Trotsky while Lenin, with the help of Joseph Stalin, fled to Finland, travelling with forged papers under the name of Konstantin Ivanov. A socialist and stirring orator named Alexander Kerensky became Russia's new prime minister and was hailed as the man who would save Russia from anarchy. The army's commander-in-chief, General Kornilov, believed Russia's war effort was being undermined by chaos at home, and deliberately sabotaged by men like Lenin, whom he declared a German spy. So in August, he ordered his men to march on Petrograd, to restore order. Bolsheviks played a leading role in the city's defence against this attempted military coup. Their most brilliant organiser, Leon Trotsky, was released from prison and sent armed Bolshevik militias 
the Red Guards to defend key points in the city. Strikes by railway workers, many of them Bolshevik supporters, prevented Kornilov from moving his men by rail, and his soldiers began to switch sides, or simply go home. The Kornilov affair cast the Bolsheviks as saviors of the revolution. And by the end of September, they'd gained a majority in the Petrograd Soviet. In October, Lenin decided the time had come. He secretly returned from Finland to Petrograd and began preparing to seize power. On the 25th of October, the Bolsheviks made their move. Red Guards and loyal troops seized key points around the capital, and that night they stormed the Provisional Government's headquarters at the Winter Palace, an event later immortalised by Bolshevik propaganda and the great Soviet filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein. Kerensky fled the city at the last moment, narrowly avoiding capture. And the next day, at the Second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, Lenin announced the overthrow of the Provisional Government. The following months saw the Bolsheviks consolidate their hold on power while fighting a brutal civil war against counter-revolutionary, or White Russian, forces who had foreign support. Some Whites hoped to put Tsar Nicholas back on the throne. After his abdication, Nicholas and his family had been held under guard at Tsarkoye Selo, outside Petrograd, where they occupied themselves with gardening and other diversions. In summer 1917, the family was sent to Tobolsk in Siberia, where they lived under house arrest in the governor's mansion. The following spring, the Bolsheviks had the family moved to Yekaterinburg. In July 1918, as white forces approached the city, Bolshevik soldiers gathered the whole family in a cellar. The Tsar, his wife, their son Alexei, their four daughters, Olga, Tatiana, Maria and Anastasia, as well as four servants, and executed them all. Russia's civil war was one of the 20th century's most devastating events. An estimated two million soldiers lost their lives, while a typhus epidemic and famine claimed the lives of a further nine million civilians. By the end of 1921, the Bolsheviks had emerged victorious and under Lenin's determined and uncompromising leadership, set about building a new socialist order. The Soviet Union, created in 1922, emerged as a world superpower following the defeat of Nazi Germany in World War II. But it would always remain a single-party state, where all opposition or dissent was ruthlessly suppressed. Those brief hopes for Russian democracy, that flowered amid the euphoria of the February Revolution, were extinguished by the Bolshevik October Revolution, and put beyond reach for decades to come. Bridgman Images are the leading supplier of art, culture and historic images and footage, representing many of the world's This is our citations. Okay, you need to bring those typed up to class the next time you come to class, okay? And I might forget to ask you, so you can't forget to hand them in. All right. Okay. All right? All right. 
Okay, now I'm going to enter attendance in Trillium. It says we have 24 people, but we actually only have 23. So first of all, Japanese, are you here? stop presenting? Sorry? How can I stop presenting? You press stop. Where? I don't know where. It says stop. Okay, okay. I see it. Okay. Now the number went down to 23. Japanese, are you here? Yeah, I'm here, miss. Yeah, I'm marking you late. Class starts at 1, not 110. Yeah, my bad. Okay. Yeah. And Tasia, are you here? All right. Give me a second just to enter attendance, guys. All right, that is pretty score. <coughs> Hold on, my wire is up in the chair. All right. I almost fell off my chair. Give me a second. It's okay if you laugh. Okay, guys, take out your study questions for uh, the chapter seven. Chapter seven, let's take them up. All right, chapter seven, number one. What does the food shortage on animal farms show about A, the conditions on the farm? Alan? Um, it shows that the farm isn't going well because there's like a food shortage and that you can see that it's not being managed well. And it kind of went back to the way how Mr. Jones was, um, how Mr. Jones was managing it. Excellent point. It does remind us about the days of Mr. Jones and how the poor, the farm was poorly managed and um, the animals didn't have enough food. So we see that the conditions are deteriorating because the farm is poorly managed. Uh, so for example, the corn ration was reduced uh, to make up for it if there was an extra potato ration but the potatoes were not covered thickly enough and they were plagued with frost. They were inedible. <coughs> so, <coughs> starvation stared them in the face. And what does it also show about the pride of the animals? Japanese? Japanese? Koa? Can't hear you. We can't hear you, Koa. Okay. Um some how about uh Aiden? The animals are losing hope uh in the farm. The pride of the animals. What does it say about their pride? Like. 
Did anyone get that question? What does it show about the pride of the animals, Siddhartha? Um, so I say, uh, Napoleon, um, in the barrels, he uh, filled the barrels um, to the brim with sand and then put grain over it. And then he brought in Mr. Wimper to show, oh, we still have food. So I can tell the outside. Yes, but it wasn't only Napoleon. It was all the animals, right? Good point, said Harson. That's exactly what I was looking for. So, you know, they didn't want the outside world to know that they were failing, right? Uh, and they wouldn't give in no matter what the conditions. Um, so they would do that. They would fill the um barrels with uh what was it sand yeah and then just put the food on top uh to show the outside world that they were doing fine or they put the grain on top so that mr whimper would see all that grain and report to the outside world that there was no shortage on animal farm so you know the uh, napoleon is ruthless and cruel with the animals he knows the truth why the windmill fell um Humans said because the walls were not thick enough. Uh, so now Napoleon decides to build them three feet thick. And obviously he doesn't want the outside world, the humans, to make fun of him. So even though it was his fault because, you know, he didn't um, have the animals build the, the walls thick enough, he tells the animals that it was snowball and forces them to undergo the exhausting, laborious task of rebuilding the windmill. And, you know, because all of their efforts are on building the windmill, the farm is being neglected, right? And this is why they are nearly starving to death. And this is all because of Napoleon's pride. He wants to show that windmill to the outside world. And, uh, you know, he wants the outside world to see the windmill so that they can uh, uh, marvel at how wonderful everything is happening on Animal Farm. It seems to me that he's even worse than Mr. Jones. Number two, what is the function and role of Snowball in this chapter? What is the function and role of Snowball, Mekdi? Snowball is a scapegoat. Go on. Oh, that's all I wrote. Mekdi, that is an insufficient answer for a grade 11 university student. You need to explain. Snowball is a scapegoat is not enough. Sarah? Sarah? Alan? So, uh, used, uh, he was portrayed as a villain and a scapegoat, but especially by Squealer, because he tried to rile up the animals and make them very mad and try to blame him so that it, it would seem as if that the Squealer and Napoleon weren't at fault. Yes, exactly. That's why these, you know, totalitarian governments have scapegoats. Remember, when it's Nazi Germany, you know, the, the, the scapegoat was the Jewish people. They blamed all the troubles and the decline in the economy and the unemployment and all the problems that Germany was having. They blamed all that on the Jews. That's why these totalitarian systems uh, of government, uh, these dictatorships have scapegoats so that the ruler can appear to be faultless, can, be, can appear to be like God. You know, when it comes to Snowball, no one knew exactly where he was. Sometimes he was supposedly at Pinchfield, other times he was at Foxwood. We, of course, realize uh, that this depends on which man Napoleon is dealing with at the moment, right? So if he's trying to strike a deal with Foxwood, uh, then they say that Snowball is at Pinchfield, right? And vice versa. 
And if anything happened, he was the one to blame. He was the one coming to the farm at night, breaking the windows, breaking the eggs, etc. And the pigs are doing this on purpose um, so that if something goes wrong, they can automatically blame it on Snowball, which diverts the attention away from what the pigs are doing, right? Because they are doing a lot of things wrong. And the animals who are dumb, right, take a long time to figure it out because their attention is on Snowball, right? And uh, so they may never figure it out at all. And this is what the pigs are hoping for. So, you know, it's twofold. They have a scapegoat so that the leader looks infallible. They, they, they are faultless. And also it's a diversion tactic. The animals are preoccupied with Snowball and all the rumors about Snowball and him doing all these things. So they're, they're not looking at the pigs and all the things that the pigs are doing wrong. And this compares to the Russian Revolution. So, you know, I, I remember, you know, watching TV and I remember seeing lineups. Obviously, I, I wasn't alive during the Russian Revolution, but I remember seeing lineups in Russia where people were lined up when it was still communist, when people were lined up for hours and hours and hours, you know, for a roll of toilet paper, okay? Um, so we've all heard and seen these conditions of poverty, the rationing of food, standing in long hours, long lines for hours to receive rations. Uh, and this is because the government in Russia was spending a lot of money on the military. Uh, if you think about it, in a short period of time, they went from a country that wasn't even industrialized to one that could militarily and technologically compete with the United States, the world's strongest superpower. Um, so when the people asked what was happening with all the money, uh, the government didn't want to say that they were spending it all on these things, on the military. So they lied and said that it was the fault of the Western countries, the capitalists, who wanted to keep them down economically, to suppress their growth and strength as an enemy, right? So. You know, Russia had the Western countries and the Western capitalists as their scapegoat and would blame all of Russia's uh, problems and the fact that their people were starving and didn't have enough supplies on the Western countries. But meanwhile, it was because they were spending so much money on the military so that they can compete and on technology and industrialization so that they can compete with the U.S. Number three, what does Squealer do in this chapter and how does this portray him as an even more reprehensible character? What does he do? Ozazi? Um, Squealer tries to motivate the animals and warn them about Snowball, basically. Yes, but what does he tell them about Snowball? Um, I read he said something about terrible things happening to the farm. Like, um, an example I put was, uh, he has, like, he's a secret agent of Jones the entire time and, uh, kind of faked his good deeds in the farm. Okay. That he was a secret agent of Jones. Very good. Right. And that, you know, he was working on Jones's side from the very beginning. And he says that documents have been found proving that Snowball was a traitor and an agent of Jones from the very beginning, right? So, you know, his bravery in the Battle of the Cowshed, again, they are rewriting history, right? Because now they're changing the events of the Battle of the Cowshed where Snowball fought bravely and he was the whole strategist, right? He's the one who's strategized the entire attack uh, and so they're taking that away, right? They're rewriting history. Um, so this is the way in which the pigs, dictatorships, control people. Propaganda, brainwashing, conditioning, terrors, uh, scapegoats, the perversion of truth, uh, the perversion of language, the perversion of, or rewriting of history, right? And it is Boxer who tries to take a stand against this. 
right? He's the one who tries to speak up and say that he remembers Snowball fighting bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed. Boxer says he does not believe it because he himself saw Snowball fight bravely in the Battle of the Cowshed. Uh, it is only when Squealer tells him that Napoleon has stated categorically that Snowball was Jones's agent from the beginning that Boxer believes him and ironically utters the slogan that has been engraved in his head. If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. Okay, so again, this demonstrates the brainwashing and the conditioning that they're using to control the animals and therefore people. Number four, why does Napoleon carry out a purge of all the undesirables? Why does he carry out this purge? Um, Gian? Carries out a purge of all undesirables so that the animals can confess that they are Snowball's secret spies. Okay. Um, what about the hens? What about the hens? Harsimran? Um, I think they were to uh, give 400 eggs every week for a, tra a trade with Mr. Wimper. And what did the hens do? Um, I think, I'm not sure. What did the hens do? Alan? They kept it for themselves. The eggs? Yeah. No. Guys, what did the hens do? Jason? Um, they defied um, Napoleon. Um, they went to the roofs and they laid their eggs there so the egg would break when they hit the ground. So they Thank you, Jason. Yep. Thank you. Don't you guys know what the hens did with their eggs? They smashed their eggs. They laid them from the rafters and smashed their eggs because Napoleon wanted to sell their eggs um, and make money off their eggs, right? I mean, that was one of the things that uh, Old Major had warned them about, saying that Mr., you know, that... Uh, Mr. Jones was going to, whatever, Mr. Jones had sold their eggs or whatever. So that was a big deal. So the hens were, were laid their eggs from the rafters, basically so that if they can't have their eggs, neither can Napoleon. This is an analogy of the Russian Revolution. When Stalin decided that Russia needed large mechanized farms, collective farms. So he would take everyone's farms away and collect them and join them together, okay? And people who had owned these farms uh, for a long time and passed them down in their families and, right? They no longer owned their farms. The government took their farms away. So a lot of them ended up, you know, killing their animals, right? And burning their crops because they thought, if I can't have my farm, I won't let the government have it either. Um, millions of these people, of these farmers, were deported and killed beginning in 1928 to 1929. And uh, Napoleon carries out the purge of all undesirables so that the rebellion of the hens can be blamed on Snowball and not the injustice of the pigs taking away the hens' eggs. This way, the animals will not side with the hens and start to question the pigs' policies, or worse, revolt against them. It's also to scare the animals. Terror is a very useful tool when achieving total obedience. Okay, so, you know, the pigs had the dogs, and the Bolsheviks, or Joseph Stalin, had the KGB, okay?
who carries out the execution? The dogs carry out the execution. And why is Boxer attacked? Um, Amy? Um, wasn't it because he leaked himself with Snowball in the past? Sorry? Because he leaked himself with Snowball in the past? Because he sided with Snowball? In the past. In the past? Okay. Um, what it's, what, it's because Boxer said, tried to speak up and defend Snowball and say that he had fought bravely in the Battle of the Cow Shed, right? Many of the animals don't remember the Battle of the Cow Shed because they weren't around at that time, right? Um, they don't want Boxer telling them what it used to be like or telling them that the pigs are lying. Um, So the, the four pigs that were executed first were the ones who had protested when Napoleon abolished meetings. Or they had tried to protest but were immediately silenced by the dogs. Then many other animals, beginning with the three hens, who were the ringleaders in the hen revolt, uh, begin to confess crimes and one by one they are all slaughtered. <coughs> Okay, so we've already discussed this topic in the Russian Revolution. The execution of the animals is an analogy of Stalin's purges of the 1930s. From 1934 to 1939, the secret police arrested and interrogated and deported or killed hundreds of thousands of people in the Soviet Union, mostly Communist Party officials. Okay, so these were people in Stalin's party. Right, but he was so paranoid, he kept thinking that people were turning against him. Uh, people in his army, army officials, and their families and friends. Two series of public trials were held in Moscow in which old Bolsheviks who had made the revolution and fought in the civil war, which was the ultimate betrayal because they, they were killing Bolsheviks, were accused of plotting with enemy agents. They surprised everyone when they confessed one after another to most awful crimes. Uh, most of them are condemned to death and shot. So ten or animal farm, it was proved that the reasons were the result of brainwashing and torture. So they basically tortured these confessions out of these people and then killed them. Number four, both Boxer and Clover felt that something has gone farm. How are they disillusioned? How do they try to explain it? Jasmine? Boxer and 